good evening to uh, everyone uh, and welcome to faculty colloquium uh, right organized by uh, of course our faculty colloquium team professor ratna kumar and professor dilip and the whole team and office of the alumni and corporate relations so this is the second talk in the series concerning the recent works which were awarded the nobel prize and this time uh, 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 we requested uh, uh, professor sudhakar chandran uh, from our department of physics uh, to enlighten us uh, with his uh, talk uh, in the series concerning the recent works which were awarded the nobel prizes the title of this uh, talk uh, what professor sudhakar chandran has decided is to professor john b good enough and the lithium ion batteries uh so as uh, all of us know uh, very well that the lithium ion battery has uh, is the uh, advance is it's an advanced right battery technology uh that is, uses lithium ion as a key component uh, of its electrochemistry uh and lithium ion batteries are capable of having a very high voltage and a charge storage per unit mass and a unit volume and uh, as uh, professor uh, sudhakar uh, uh, Ch sudhakar chandran has pointed out in his abstract that the lithium ion batteries are ubiquitous uh, as today we are using it everywhere every one of us hold it in one or the other electronic device uh, we have with us this was possible due to the tireless research and development and enabling technology um uh, where many have contributed in last 4 to 5 decades and uh, certainly uh, professor john b good enough professor b stanley white them and professor akira yosino their work has helped us to uh, right uh, use this battery for many many applications and for that they received the nobel prize in chemistry in 2019 so Pro professor sudhakar chandran uh who, who is uh, going to enlighten us in this uh, regard in this work uh, he is an uh, associate professor at iit madras in our uh, department of uh, physics earlier he has worked in kth that is royal institute of technology sweden and vene state university detroit as a postdoctoral fellow and research assistant professor uh, his major research interest are in understanding the defect structure of uh, property correlations of multifunctional materials the materials of interest includes oxides calcogenides and nitrites and developing tailoring and engineering the material and its properties for the energy applications including lithium ion battery solar cells and multi ferro uh, ferroics are in, in his current research so may i request uh, professor sudhakar chandran Uh, to write uh, deliver a talk uh, which can write we, we will be very much very happy to hear you, you thank you very much for your time as well in preparation thank you uh, professor wasam uh, i must thank uh, the faculty association and the team uh, for inviting uh, me to present a work done by professor john b gurinath and his contributions on lithium ion batteries Uh, last year nobel prize that is the uh, 2019 uh, nobel prize in chemistry was awarded to three researchers uh, professor john b goodenough is uh, one among them the other two are professor uh, stanley wittingham and uh, akira yoshino so all these uh, uh, three were uh, given the nobel prize for their development uh, for, for their contributions in developing the lithium ion batteries so i will uh, present in this talk the contribution uh, mostly i will uh, highlight the contributions uh, which john b good enough did uh, so let me start uh, uh, with a, a brief introduction to uh, professor good enough he was born in jena germany uh, of course an american uh, citizen and he grew up mostly in new haven connecticut Uh, initially he did his undergrad uh, in maths at yale um then after uh, ap after he served as a army uh, captain during the world war second um he went back to uh, school in the university of chicago where he found the intuition to pursue uh, physics 
um, after his graduation, um, he uh, spent almost two and a half decades at the uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory as a research scientist and team leader, mostly working on uh, transition metal oxides uh, for random access memory applications. And then he moved to Oxford University in 1976. Uh, there he added an inorganic chemistry group, though he didn't have any uh, chemistry uh, background as such. Um, in 1986, he went back. Of course, uh, in Oxford University, only his uh, prize-winning uh, work came out. And he went back to University of Texas, Austin in 1986. He had received many uh, medals. And just to point out, the one, uh, one given by Professor, uh, uh, the uh, President uh, uh, Medal, uh, National Medal of Science. Of course, uh, he is the one of the oldest person to have ever won uh, the Nobel Prize. So, with that brief introduction, uh, let me get it. Let me summarize this. Uh, he's basically a solid state physicist. He uh, he had contributed. Uh, he had made the outstanding contributions uh, in solid state physics. His investigations uh, on cooperative atomic orbital ordering in transient metal compounds has led to the realization of uh, first random access memory. Um, of course, uh, the, from the work he did on transition metal oxides, um, he formulated rules for a uh, sign of magnetic interactions in uh, transition between transition metal ions with the different uh, d orbital uh, configurations and uh, different geometric con configurations. So this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, is known as a good enough Kanamari rule. Uh, mostly you will, you will find this as a book material in magnetic uh, uh, magnetism topic. So just to give an, uh, just to give an idea about it, super exchange interaction between uh, two, uh, the, the, the super exchange interaction between transfer metal ions, for example, or antiferromagnetic, when the virtual transfer over, uh, virtual transfer between the overlapping orbitals uh, takes place when the orbitals themselves are half filled. Uh, so this particular case I have uh, I have shown is for 180 degree uh, metal cation oxygen metal cation bonding angle. In fact, such a uh, such a prediction works uh, even for uh, ang bond angles between 120 degrees degree to 180 degrees. On the other hand, if it is half filled or empty. Then these uh, good enough Kanamari rules are very well known. It uh, qualitatively tells about the materials, uh, whether it is antiferromagnet or ferromagnet and so on. It is extensively used by uh, magnetic uh, uh, people who are doing magnetic research. Uh, of course, his other, um, other research uh, include phase transition and phase segregation. Uh, he had extensively worked on uh, inorganic solid state electrolytes. Uh, one of the well-known Nazicon structure, which is sodium uh, super super ion conducting conductors, uh, one of the compound he originally discovered, and he has also worked on high TC superconductor. So, with that introduction, let me move on to the battery research. Uh, before getting into what uh, Professor Goodenough did, I'll give a brief introduction to the battery. Uh, of course, the battery is. It seems it is known. It's not something new for us. It is known well, almost 2,000 years old. So one of the ba ba Baghdad, the Baghdad battery, uh, which uh, has a ter terracotta jars with copper sheet inlay and uh, iron rod inserted, is, is seems to be the oldest battery uh, we have found. But the, the name battery itself was coined by uh, be Benjamin Franklin. Um, so he, he, mostly he was working on linked capacitors. And then, um, uh, the animal electricity uh, was uh, was shown by Galvano, Galvani. That's uh, most of the school books you will see it. And uh, the first electrochemical cell was designed by Volta. So since then, you know, many primary batteries. Primary batteries are basically uh, one-time use. There is no you cannot reuse it again by charging it or so on. So many uh, many uh, batteries came up. They, they got redesigned, it evolved slowly, uh, zinc batteries, uh, and then uh, such batteries came, and then most of the well-known batteries are table, given in the table. So lead acid batteries, uh, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, these are all rechargeable batteries which came, but 
most of, most of these batteries, you know, they have uh, electrodes, anode and cathode. The cathode is positive electrode and anode is negative electrode and uh, electrolyte uh, filled in between them. The electrolyte is, uh, uh, it's, it is uh, electronically, uh, it doesn't conduct the charges, but it connects the ions. So that's the structure of the battery. Uh, lithium ion batteries came up, that I also uh, highlighted here, but I will tell about, but you can see very contrasting difference. The voltage of the lithium ion batteries are almost uh, two to three times more than uh, any of the batteries known uh, previously. Of course, the very use of uh, lithium in the lithium ion battery itself uh, came uh, because of the reason that uh, it exhibits a very high capacity and also gives very high uh, discharge rate. Uh, this is possible because lithium is mostly electropositive. The most electropositive uh, element we have, it's the very lightest one, and therefore it facilitates uh, the design of the storage systems with high energy density. Okay, so uh, one, of the, one other important thing which came up was uh, during 1960s and 70s is the intercalation compound, which uh, Stanley Whittingham, in fact, coined the word. Um, it was crucial for the development of high energy rechargeable lithium ion batteries. So many compounds uh, uh, with intercalation, intercalation compounds uh, uh, came up during that time. So just to point out what it is, for example, uh, I, uh, uh, titanium disulfide it just, is, is one of the examples of intercalation compound. In this compound, you can shut, you can insert and remove the lithium uh, ion without uh, uh, the structure undergoing any drastic changes. So these compounds are called intercalation compounds. Of course, as you fill up lithium into, into these uh, host lattice, they, the conduction band gets filled up with the electrons as well. So um, with this uh, as the cathode, Stanley Whittingham uh, first, uh, he, he demonstrated the first rechargeable lithium ion battery when he was at uh, Exxon Corporation. And uh, he used the titanium disulfide as the cathode and the metal lithium as the anode and the electrolyte, lithium perchlorate based electrolyte. And this particular battery gave two volts. Uh, of course, the, the the charging cycle and discharging cycle curves are shown here. I mean, charging curves are shown here. You can see that the voltage varies from uh, almost like 1.5 to 2.5 volt. Um, I think this will be the right time to give a little interaction on how a battery works. Um, so here's a small video which shows uh, how the battery functions. So I took the uh, lithium, titan lithium titanium disulfide as an example. When, uh, when lithium is not there in titanium disulfide, that is a charged state. So with lithium inside titanium disulfide, the battery is in a discharge state. So, so it moves from the discharge state to charge state, and then it comes back when you, as you discharge. You can also see that as the lithium goes to the anode, uh, it gets filled up, the, the electrons get filled up, and then the Fermi energy moves, and the same thing happens on the other side as well. So the cell voltage is basically determined by uh, the uh, difference between uh, the redox potential energies of the anode and cathode. For example, I, I have shown here clearly. So this is the redox uh, potential of the anode and cathode. So this gives the net voltage. So in the case of titanium disulfide, titanium, the Fermi energy is in the titanium uh, 3D orbitals and 3D energy levels. And then the Fermi energy of lithium is here. So the voltage is you get. Um, uh, but then the voltage you get in titanium disulfide is 2.5 volt. And, uh, and this is, the, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the largest voltage they could get with any of the sulfide uh, as the cathode. Of course, the, uh, just to point out the theoretical capacity, it's basically uh, how much charge you can pump uh, store in the anode and cathode, that's what it is. Um, so that is uh, given by this equation, where n is the number of uh, electrons per formula you need, you can put it. In this case, it is one because one lithium uh, goes in and out. And f is a Faraday constant, and uh, m is the molar weight of the materials. 
So, uh, of course, you can define the uh, energy density, which is multiplied by the voltage, and then the power density, and so on. Um, so, the one of the um, important thing uh, with this particular uh, cell design, as uh, Stanley Whittingham came up with, it exhibited uh, 2.5 volt, which is very good. The, the cyclability was good, but then it had a problems. Uh, so the shortcomings are that you know in in this device when lithium goes back and forth, um, it doesn't get uniformly coated every time. Instead, it grows very uneven on the lithium surface, and therefore dendrite-like growths happen. So as as one of the picture microscopic picture is shown, the dendrites grow, and eventually they touch the cathode, and they internally short circuit the battery. Therefore, what happens is uh, the battery uh, catches fire, and uh, with the electrolytes, which are uh, which can easily catch fire, you know, it, it explodes, and that was a problem. And uh, to some extent, they try to mitigate this by using some alloy, lithium aluminum alloy, but then the cyclability goes bad. There were efforts to um, there, there were efforts to commercialize these batteries during the 1980s, but then. Uh, finally, they had to drop because of these fire hazards. This is when Professor John Goodenough's uh, contribution came. So he, being a solid state physicist, he realized that he, his basic understanding, uh, from his basic understanding for the three decades of working on transition metal oxides, he realized that the sulfur, the maximum voltage you can get from the sulfides is uh, less than 2.5. That is because the sulfur 3P bands uh, they lie uh, much higher, uh, just below the lithium redox, they lie at much higher. So the, the voltage is only 2.5. In, in the case of the titanium disulfide, the titanium bands, which are just 0.2 EV above this, it gives about 2.3 volt or something, uh, 2.3 volt. So, um, so, uh, um, so he realized that, you know, using oxides, uh, because uh, oxygen 2p bands, they lie at lower energy, enables access to lower lying energy bands, and therefore one can achieve uh, increased uh, uh, voltage output. So he realized that aspect, and then he came up with uh, uh, a structurally similar compound. He explored the structurally similar compounds of LiMO2. So uh, the titanium disulfide has a close packing. Uh, structure sulfur in and then the titanium six in the octahedral sites they form a van der Waal compound layer compound and in between these layers uh, lithium uh, goes uh, in and out so he found a similar compound uh, in LiMO2 of course uh, a systematic uh, studies was a systematic study was carried out um, in his in his group uh, LiMO2 with a layered structure and there were very few compounds they could see. For example, titanium was there, but then the titanium uh, had very low voltage for the reason that the titanium uh, energy levels lie much closer to the uh, lithium redox uh, energies. Uh, on the other hand, vanadium, uh, manganese, uh, and iron, which, in, which could be prepared in, in the layer compound, they always uh, stabilize in the either structurally uh, transformed to spinel. Uh, structure or they, they did not form good cathodes. Chromium compounds were uh, they had very large polarization. Polarization means you know it it, uh, it, uh, it is very difficult to uh, put the charge in and out, so it, it introduces large uh, uh, resistance to uh, the charge transfer. So that was not possible. And then nickel had a problem of oxidation; it would always get reduced, and then lithium goes away during the high synthesis. And it, it was only compound they could find is the LiCO2. It was like a magic compound. Uh, so of course the, it's, it's, it came out of hard work. They found that LiCO2 uh, they could reversibly extract half of a lithium in this uh, compound. So it had a. Um, it, it also gave a good uh, uh, cationic ordering. Basically, the cationic ordering arises because lithium. Uh, plus and uh, cobalt three plus uh, because of large difference in the charge and also uh, the ionic radii 
they don't mix up between these layers. So lithium sits in the octahedral layer, uh, it's of its own, and cobalt sits in its, its own uh, octahedral layer. So the diffusion of lithium was uh, much uh, better in this compound. Um, it had a very good, uh, basically, it had a very good structural stability. It also exhibited very high electrical stability, uh, electrical conductivity. So initially, uh, it had exhi it exhibits a, a metal, I mean, insulated character. The moment you uh, remove lithium, it becomes a metallic. So the metal insulated transition uh, takes place in this compound, uh, and it happens because of uh, the introduction of holes into the uh, T2G6 uh, bands. So they are very good connectors, as such you don't need to uh, worry about how to extract the charges from these cathodes. So they had a good structural stability, they had a, a good electrical conductivity, the ionic conductivity was good, therefore fast charge and discharging characteristics was possible. In fact, the lithium goes from one, uh, from one octahedra to other octahedra through the tetrahedral sides, uh, which lies in between. And typical energy required is about uh, 0.2 to 0.3 EV. So this was like a uh, wonder, wonderful material uh, that uh, John Goodenough came up with. And uh, it solved two major problems. In, in Goodenough's uh, group, they were looking for, uh, of course, uh, when he was working on uh, inorganic solid electrolyte compounds, oxide based compounds, they, and then after the uh, titanium disulfide work, they, they were looking for two. A dual problem. One problem is to replace the lithium with the uh, intergalactic compound, and the other one is to replace the cathode with a high voltage material. So, so this particular discovery enabled uh, increasing operating voltage. And uh, the other problem is uh, in the titanium disulfide, uh, like the battery, the titanium disulfide doesn't have lithium to begin with, whereas uh, this compound has lithium. To begin with, which means when you when you assemble the battery, this compound is in a discharge state, whereas the titanium disulfide is in a charge state. The battery made uh, using titanium disulfide cathodes are in charge state, which means you know it gives a lot of uh, engineering related problems to assemble the batteries. So this particular compound was very useful. Of course, um, un until uh, Akira Yoshino uh, came up with the uh, a suitable anode, the birth, the birth of lithium ion battery was not realized. So um, he used some uh, carbon based material, uh, which also had a layered structure and lithium can easily interconnect between the layers. And so that gave a lithium free anode, the graphitic anode, uh, which was suitable for uh, lithium cobalt oxide as cathode to begin with. Therefore, uh, your batteries could be assembled and uh, uh, Akira Yoshino showed that if you make the battery using lithium metal, lithium metal as the anode, if you hammer the batteries you make, they catch fire very easily. Whereas the lithium ion batteries made with uh, graphene does not catch fire. And this instant is uh, considered as the birth of lithium ion batteries. Of course, a Sony company went on to make the first uh, commercial batteries uh, using this uh, material. There is a, there was a, this is not something, uh, again, completely, uh, you know, acceptable compound for the reason that the lithium you, can, you could extract from this compound, LiCO2, is only half. So you, you cannot remove the other half. The reason is that the cobalt redox, the cobalt energy levels, you know, they, they overlap with the oxygen 2P bands. And therefore, what happens if you try to extract more than half the lithium? you also tend to remove the electrons from the 2B bands, which makes the oxygen to escape from the lattice, and therefore the structure collapses. So despite its wonderful uh, cathode properties, uh, it could not be uh, used to its fullest, fullest capacity. And the problems that exist till today, there is no compound you can get where you can, you can get one lithium equivalent uh, uh, you can extract one lithium from, from the formula unit. Uh, so before moving into the contributions, other contributions we made, I will just make a point here. Of course, the lithium cobalt oxide uh, has evolved over years into one of the uh, compounds that is most well known is the NMC compound. 
in this compound, the cobalt is e replaced, substituted with nickel and manganese in equal proportions. Of course, there are many different compositions. I'll show in the next slide. Um, so this particular compound is very special for the reason that the in presence of manganese, manganese nickel always uh, it tries to stay in the two plus state because of the energy levels. So it reduces the nickel manganese gets oxidized and uh, and therefore the chemical stability for manganese is much better than this and uh, most of the lithium redox happens uh, between the nickel and cobalt compound and this particular one gave much better uh, capacity up, up to 160 uh, milli ampere hour per gram and there are many such compounds that are, that are being explored even today just to point out the the complexity that is involved in deciding the, the, the right composition, you can see uh, in this uh, phase diagram, uh, some of the important compounds uh, that, that are known are highlighted. They are given names based on the ratio of the nickel to manganese to cobalt. For example, 4 to 4 means 40% uh, uh, nickel and 20% uh, manganese and 40% uh, cobalt, like that. So. There are many, many different comp compositions explored, but then what happens if you try to increase the discharge capacity, then the thermal stability decreases and also the capacity retention decreases, but then we, we want the preferred performance to be somewhere there. So there is always a give and take that handles. So a lot of studies still going on to find out the suitable material which can give very high capacity and also can retain the uh, capacity over large number of cycles in the batteries. So with that, let me move on to the uh, second class of uh, oxide materials, which uh, came up from Professor Goodenough's uh, group. Uh, Mike Thackeray, uh, he, he was a researcher from South Africa. Uh, he realized, he showed that lithium can be inserted reversibly in a uh, Fe3O4 structure. It's uh, basically the magnetic uh, material, you, you all know it's a low stone. And uh, till then it was realized that you need to have a layered structure in order to insert the lithium very smoothly in between the um, layers. But then he showed that uh, fe 3 4 which has a spinel structure where the octahedra are con connected in all directions, he showed that it is possible to reversibly um, intercalate uh, the lithium. So he came to Professor Goodenough's group and then with uh, Goodenough uh, together, they came up with a second material. That's a second wonderful material, LiMN204. It's a spinel composition. The lithium sits uh, in the A sites. That is the ATA position, the Wyckoff uh, positions. And then the manganese uh, sits at the 16B position. And oxygen forms a close packing again, cubic close packing. Um, so, this particular compound, uh, the lithium again diffuses from uh, octahedral, uh, the tetrahedral sites. It, it sits in the tetrahedral site, so one tetrahedral site to other tetrahedral site through the uh, 16C uh, sites here. So the direct manganese manganese interaction across the MnO6 octahedra edges and also the mixed valent uh, high spin uh, state. Uh, it enables the good hopping electronic conduction in these compounds. Of course, the, the conductivity, unlike uh, in LiCO2, it is uh, the conduction in this case uh, is through the small polar arms, and it's a small polar arm hopping conductor. So, this particular compound have has a very good structural stability, and therefore it enables fast charge discharge characteristics. It also has a voltage four volt, um, and uh, in this compound. Lithium one, if you try to remove one lithium, you can get uh, 130 milliampere hour per gram. So, this is another wonderful material they came up with. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this is uh, patented in South Africa, uh, which uh, good enough gracefully agreed for uh, that. So, in this particular compound, it was shown that you can also insert second lithium. In LiMN204 is spinel, you can put one more lithium and they showed it is possible. Therefore, the capacity could be increased to 270 milliampere hour per gram. Beautiful science came out of this uh, thing. 
In fact, the moment you try to put second lithium, the voltage which was at four decreases to close to 2.83. So this, uh, the, the reason for this is uh, the lithium which was initially at 8A position, now it, it moves to 16C position. And uh, there is an associated distortion uh, in the structure. Uh, the distortion comes because of the ondular uh, effect. The manganese in four plus, when it becomes manganese three plus, you know, uh, there's the electrostatic repulsion between the oxygen 2P one bonding uh, orbitals uh, and then the D orbitals, which uh, leads to the distortion of the octahedra. And that makes the cubic spinel structure to undergo tetrahedral spinel structure. So, uh, this particular, in fact, uh, in the very first. Uh, uh, first uh, uh, charging, uh, discharging cycle also, you can see two steps and that uh, is associated with the redistribution of lithium ions. So this particular uh, structure uh, told many things, there is a site dependent uh, uh, voltage that a material can give. For example, in this, in this region, it gives around 4 volt. There itself, you have two different, uh, two different kinds of lithium distribution and therefore the voltage slightly changes. And the other one, uh, with, if you try to put the second lithium, the voltage is totally different. This but second lithium insertion could not be uh, utilized uh, for practical applications for the reason that uh, it undergoes a tetrahedral spinel structure, uh, which has a huge uh, uh, structural distortion, and therefore the material becomes, you know, uh, pulverizes. So you cannot do it. Uh, uh, you, you cannot practically utilize the uh, uh, extra uh, specific capacity to install. So that still remains a challenge till today. So in, uh, the other advantage uh, of LIMN204 over cobalt is uh, it's very cheap. The co co cobalt is becoming very, uh, very costly and it is uh, also toxic. So uh, manganese is found to be the uh, better option for cobalt, but then there are other issues with uh, this compound. The manganese uh, kind of easily dissolves in the electrolyte. It undergoes the disproportionation reaction. Manganese uh, 3 plus would become 2 plus and 4 plus and 4 plus will get retains in the solid and you have, uh, 2 plus gets leached out in the solution because of the, the electrolyte. And also these uh, 2 plus get shuttled to the anode and where, where it gets coated and therefore you have a limited cycle life. So there are many issues. Uh, of course, uh, like uh, LICO, LIMO2 structure, many other, uh, many other spinel compounds were explored. Titanium has a spinel, a spinel oxide, but then again, its voltage is very less because of the titanium 3D levels for the, the where, it, uh, where it positioned itself in the band structure. Uh, vanadium, it undergoes structural uh, change. The cobalt, nickel oxide, they cannot, they, they are very unstable in the high oxidation state. Therefore, the only uh, compound that could uh, stay structurally stable is uh, LIMN, uh, LIMN204. There were other compounds, people, uh, so they, they substituted two different material, two different elements, and tried. One of the compounds, very promising, is the uh, if you substitute 0.5 nickel in uh, in the place of manganese, that is LIMN 1.5 and 8.504. This operates at much higher voltage than the, than the LIMN to around 4.7 volt over the capacity, which means you know you can increase the, the energy density. But then the problem is uh, you don't have a suitable electrolyte. The electrolyte will undergo redox reactions if you if you go beyond certain voltage. So there are issues uh, with that too. So yeah, with that second uh, compound which came up from uh, Professor Goodenough's uh, work, let me move on to the third class of uh, uh, oxides. So he, he, the compound I mentioned that he came up with inorganic solid electrolytes, the Nazicon based one, that was a original contribution from Goodenough as this. He was working on several oxides as well as I mentioned. And uh, they, uh, Professor uh, uh, Arvogam Mantiran, who was a, who graduated from IIT Madras then, he joined uh, Professor Gudinov's groups as a postdoc. So 
So they wanted to explore some of these uh, polyanionic compounds. So you don't have oxygen as an anion here. You have an MOO4 as an anion. So it's it's a that's why it's a polyanion. And uh, Mathiran found out that when he studied Fe2WO4 cries and moly polyanion, he found that the voltage around 3.3 3 volts, which is much higher than the ion oxide itself would give. So Becoming curious, uh, they also explored sulfate polyanionic compounds. So these are all the these all exhibit the Nancy Cohen structure, and they found that it exhibits 3.6 volt. So the voltage could be increased by changing the polyanion type. So here, pictorially, it is shown Fe2O3 has a less than 2.5 volt. The moment you put moly or tungsten, it is 3 volt. Sulfate, it's 3.6. And they explain this based on the inductive effect. So in this particular Nazicon structure, the iron, oxygen, the moly, oxygen, iron, they, they are connected well because of the structural connection they have. And the, uh, for example, the moly-oxygen bonding is uh, very covalent, highly covalent, and that weakens the covalent character of the, the covalency of the FIBO bond. In other words, they don't, the electronegativity changes if you change the polyanions. So, as the electronegativity increases, it pushes the Fe2 plus Fe3 plus the redox uh, energy level down, which results in increase in the cell voltage. So, with uh, again with a large number of uh, experiments, these these ones, although it could be, it could uh, exhibit 3.6 volt, it could not be used because of the energy uh, the the capacity is very less because it has two extra sulfate, um, more number of sulfate, which is inactive. Um, so they came up with this LIFEPO4 compound. And that was another wonderful material. Uh, the Padi is the one who, who did this in, in uh, good enough uh, research, uh, good enough research lab. So in this particular compound, the lithium moves in and out in a one-dimensional fashion. So there are tunnels. The tunnels are running along the B-axis, and it moves uh, in and out through the, these tunnels. Of course, it doesn't go straight. You know, people have shown theoretically that the, the position it takes, it, it goes in a kind of a, uh, wavy, uh, in a, in a wavy pattern through the channels. And this particular compound, uh, there are the, the LIMN PO4 also uh, was prepared and it, it was shown to have much higher voltage than LIFE PO4, uh, but the capacity is more or less equal. Um, so, uh, the, the, this particular uh, electron, by playing with the uh, electronegativity of the anion, one can change the voltage was shown in this particular polyanionic compounds. Of course, uh, uh, they, they, there was some confusion here. But iron being more electronegative uh, exhibits very less uh, voltage compared to manganese because as you go from the left side to the right side in the transition metal row, uh, iron would be more electronegative. But then they found that this exhibits lower voltage and they found it is in fact uh, the redox energy levels get shifted due to the pairing energy. So the sixth electron, which, which gets occupied here, it, it controls the, the energy level as well. So what controls the voltage in these compounds were thoroughly investigated uh, by Goodenough's groups. And uh, of course, uh, many different polyanionic compounds were investigated uh, since then. And uh, the, these two lines here show the 600 watt hour per kg specific energy density and uh, typically they, they wanted something uh, more than 600 then so iron and manganese found to be the suitable materials of course cobalt and nickel versions also were shown but then they could not be used because it's beyond the, the potential where you can safely operate the lithium ion battery i think beyond this you know electrolyte would go undergo Redox, uh, reduction of oxidation reaction. So came three different materials from 
um, was a good enough group. They had very different characteristics. In terms of the dimensionality of the lithium ion transport, you can see that the uh, in LiFe PO4, the polyanion compounds, lithium moves in and out in a one dimensional fashion. The layered compound has a two dimensional lithium diffusion, whereas the spinel LiMN204 uh, has a three dimensional diffusion. So, uh, to, find, to summarize the key findings uh, which Professor Gurina did uh, from his fundamental understanding on transition metal oxide. Uh, the properties he explored, he came up with, uh, he identified three different compounds, three classes of material. Uh, till today, there are no other cathode materials than these three. Most of the cathode materials are based on these. The structurally, they are similar. Layered oxides, spinel oxides, and polyanion oxides are generally, they are referred by. So he pushed the boundaries. Uh, uh, at the intersection of solid state chemistry and physics, he being the solid state physicist. Uh, in this particular picture, uh, the three compounds are shown. In addition, there are two other compounds. The NMC, uh, NMC is shown, uh, which came from, it is a uh, improved version of LiCO2 layered compound. Uh, the manganese 1.5 nickel 1.5 spinel is an, another improved version of the spinel compound they came up with. So. Uh, nowadays, people are looking at lithium-rich layered oxide, which is slightly modified version of the layered oxide. So they show close to uh, ability to show close to 200, 250 or more than 250 milliampere hour per gram. But then there are issues with cyclability and so on. So current research is mainly uh, people are carrying out to how to mitigate those uh, uh, losses. Okay, so with that introduction, uh, with that uh, detail on uh, Professor Gurinev's uh, research work, let me point out some of the things. If we, uh, so most of the most of these compounds, the, whatever the compounds, layered uh, layered oxides, polyanions, or spinel compounds, they are used in uh, applications which involves uh, uh, mobile ITs, basically mobile phones, uh, charging charging batteries, or power tools. Uh, they are also used in electro electric vehicles. Um, but then one has to understand the requirements of energy are very wide. There are about eight orders of uh, uh, difference in the energy requirements. For example, if you want batteries for watches and calculators, it's only few, uh, whatever. Uh, whereas uh, mobile phones require a few tens of whatever. Uh, and then this goes up. The moment you come for electric vehicles, you need something of 10 to the power 6. So it's, it's uh, in the order of a few hundred uh, kilowatt. Um, hour. And also for grid applications, you need much higher. So can the batteries uh, serve this purpose is a big question. For example, the Tesla model, uh, the, the electric vehicle which uh, Tesla has come up with, you can see uh, how it compares with the regular cars. Uh, the battery pack itself takes a huge uh, weight. It is 40, uh, 540 kilograms compared to 240 kilograms for the engine one. So unless uh, the, the energy density is improved almost twice, it's going to be tough uh, to get the uh, you know, viable uh, batteries for electric vehicles. Of course, there are a lot of uh, other compounds are coming up. Uh, you, one also has to, in addition to in increasing the capacity, one also has to improve the power density. The power density is basically how fast you can draw the charges. And you, if you try to draw charges much faster, then the, the voltage uh, goes down. The capacity that you can get is also goes down. So looking at the, the battery technology landscape, it doesn't scale up uh, with uh, Moore's law for electronics. It doesn't go that way. Uh, even with an uh, aggressive projection, what has been shown is in the next 30 years, if uh, the capacity energy density goes by two times, that itself will be big uh, achievement. And then the the way it can be done, uh, people are projecting. You know, lithium air is the uh, lithium air batteries are the way. They again, it's a slightly different than what the the batteries I explained based on the cathode and anode oxides. Of course, uh, there are various ways people are trying to explore uh, making the batteries uh, suitable. 
safe and cost effective if you want to if you want to make it safe then the cost goes high and therefore uh, one other area where people are uh, seeing that the batteries would serve is the solid state batteries you have to remove the lithium uh, remove the liquid electrolyte in the battery and make it uh, make it uh, solid electrolytes and that is one of the hot topic currently going on so yeah so in the in the years to go lithium ion batteries are projected of course a lot of uh, uh, research on the cathode as well as on the anode side is carried out i didn't touch upon the anode research in this um, so with with the possible uh, suitable anode and cathode and probably electrolyte solid electrolyte is possible that one can get much better batteries so we need to wait and see um, with that of course uh, these these are the, the what i showed is not the only thing uh, professor gurinath does does he works on lithium sulfur batteries lithium air batteries lithium or lithium oxide batteries sodium ion potassium ion batteries both the positive and negative electrodes a lot of things uh, his group explores one of the thing they recently came up with is a glass battery which is basically the all solid state battery they have used a uh, electrolyte uh, which is glassy in nature and show that the battery the, the performance they can get from uh, this compound uh, this particular uh, electrolyte is three times better than what they have shown but of course there was a lot of controversy related to that but seems that uh, the, there are a lot of research work going on to to make it possible uh, commercially viable so with that uh, uh, i will uh, stop so uh, professor john good enough has uh, contributed uh, in a way that has changed uh, every human uh, how they are they, they are using the uh, using the electronic devices nowadays of course uh, I, I i will not be surprised if somebody uh, holds a uh, mobile phone and sits in a terrace or or a, in a in a tree who are very far uh, from the city to catch up this stuff so without draining the battery much so i thank you all for your attention if you have any questions i will take otherwise you know in case if i'm not able to reach you or something you can always uh, email me and uh, let me stop here thank you very much for your attention Oh, I need go yes. a bit slow. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. It was a very very nice talk. Uh, we learned so many things. Uh, and uh, now, uh, now, uh, please, uh, uh, if a uh, few questions, uh, we have a little time for a few questions. And of course, afterwards uh, through email also it should be possible. However, a uh, few questions if uh, anyone would like to. Hi, Sudhakar. Hello. Can you please explain ah. what is this glass about the lithium ion, a lithium glass battery? What is the glass here? Is uh, the glass is state of lithium or? No, no, this is the electrolyte actually. So this is an electrolyte where the lithium conduction. Uh, so the, in the batteries I explained, it has a liquid electrolyte. Means you know the lithium salt is dissolved in uh, organic solvents. Okay. Whereas this is a solid uh, material, it has a very high uh, lithium ionic conductivity. And uh, of course, there was uh, I I don't know exactly the uh, the nature, but what he, what they showed is they they had a lithium on either side of this glass battery, and then they showed that it exhibited high voltage. And there was a lot of controversy because you need to have a, a difference in Fermi energy between the anode and cathode to extract voltage. But uh, this particular work, which appeared in uh, JAX, uh, uh, they showed, in, despite using lithium on either side for this particular uh, glass, uh, glassy electrolyte, they showed uh, a wonderful performance. And and of course, right now, uh, a lot of uh, the interface, uh, what happens exactly at the interface in these particular uh, batteries are being explored. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the nice lecture. Also. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, hello, this is Rangarao from Chemistry Department. Hello, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, very nice. I am so happy to listen to you. Thank you. Uh, I have one uh, small question that uh, 
you mentioned about uh, dry polymer solid state layer lithium ion batteries yeah yeah dry polymer yeah yes electrolytes that that's that are being uh, investigated is it but uh, they will have ion exchange uh, like you know like like in you know, normal effect how do they how do they exchange ions um so i don't know the exact polymer nature of what they use but then these uh, lithium ions are basically immobilized in these polymers and they can move around actually so that's what they oh i see lithium ions are uh, lithium ions are embedded in the polymer yes, that they, they move around, around. i and, see uh, so the me- the the medium is uh, solid that's right the polymer itself is solid but the lithium ions can easily move through these polymers okay so if, if that is successful i don't know whether it is successful or not if that is successful that can be applied to many many uh, other devices also right? that's true yeah i don't know i'm not a polymer person but uh, i I'm, i'm sure there are a lot of work on that direction as well yes it's it's completely multidisciplinary stuff this particular battery stuff is oh i see i'm because i i yeah yeah because i heard that you know the chinese yes, are trying yes, that yes. germans are trying that uh the, the kind right of now, uh, the, uh, 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 uh work kind of like you know electrolyte like which could be polymer or oxide based one and uh, mm-hmm. this also uh, ele- this this will make the the electrochemical window larger so that you can uh, use a high voltage uh, uh, cathode yeah, uh, for the purpose number one and also the solid uh, electrolytes they prevent the lithium growing from one side to other side the dendrite growth and all can be uh, mitigated so the short short circuiting uh, the short, shorting doesn't happen the battery explosion and all is doesn't happen that's how that's the advantage of the solid uh, state be yeah but it is operated at the same uh, temperature the, like the temperature difference is something one has to explore as well because it it, uh, it changes from the moment you change certain components it could vary so when the batteries are made there are set of uh, things one need to mm. in terms of performance evaluation one uh, people have to in, for example here uh, if the thermal management if uh, too much of heat is produced you know, you have to have thermal management uh, system in order to make that battery work so yeah a lot of components get added up to tackle the the problems uh, that that uh, comes out of the battery battery other yeah. issues yeah the oh, last no, question sorry i'm taking too much of time instead of li- yes. instead of lithium because lithium is now going to be you know yeah. very difficult uh, to get it's yeah. only available in, Ch- yes. in chile it's only available in chile i think most of it uh, can it not be replaced Uh, with any other they, for that that is not only the sodium ion batteries are being explored sodium ion potassium ion batteries uh, some of these uh, okay. predictions also say for example you can see the future here sodium ion oh, yeah, right, is also right. proposed sodium. as a future battery for this reason ah, okay okay yeah so they okay so if that is successful even sodium uh, and show that the sodium ion intercalation is also possible but a lot of research work needs to be done i think before they realize they can work work workable batteries okay so that is that is very interesting thank you so much yeah thank you sir oh. thank you uh, can i ask you a question yeah yeah yes. please uh, so you mentioned about earlier the titanium disulfide as a cathode right so yes it doesn't have a lithium right so was there any problem in starting or something like so the problem i mentioned with the titanium the titanium disulfide um let me go yeah so here what is the question i'm sorry I'm... no no i think you mentioned there is some problem in starting or something right because of the absence of lithium oh, okay. so what happens is in in titanium disulfide so uh, let me we go here uh, yeah so here when the when the lithium is in the titanium disulfide okay so basically the the lithium shuttles between the anode and cathode but when it is in titanium disulfide the battery is in a discharge state okay so whereas when the titan- when the lithium sorry when the lithium is in 
in between the titanium disulfide and the discharge state, when it is in the anode, uh, it is empty, then it is a charged state. So when you fabricate the battery using titanium disulfide as a cathode and uh, anode, whatever the anode, it is already in the charged state basically. So if you try to assemble them, uh, it would get discharged and sparking, all these engineering problems are there. That's what I mentioned. Whereas uh, with LiCO2, you have a cathode with lithium intercalated in it because uh, you cannot produce LiTiS2 basically to begin with. Whereas LiCO2 you can prepare, so you can synthesize them. So uh, due to this, you know, you can assemble the batteries in a discharge state. That's what I mentioned. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. In yeah, hi. Yeah. Uh, hi, Sudhakar uh, Chandran. Uh, this is uh, Indu Panditiwari. Uh, I'm working. This is, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is Indu Panditiwari. Yes. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm from USA right now. Yeah. So, so I have one question. Uh, in this lithium glass battery, yes. uh, this glass is polymer of fiber. Uh, what is the action of this uh, glass? Uh, means it is work as a cathode or it is work as a anode? In, it is an electrolyte. So the one I mentioned on the last slide, is it? Yeah, please, please continue. Yeah, so this it is basically uh, oxide, uh, something like, you know, Nazicon, uh, inorganic solid electrolyte, oxide based one. It is something of that sort. Even I'm not sure exactly what is the chemi what is the chemistry and how the voltage is coming and so on. So, but what it is, is it's basically a glassy. Glassy means, you know, there is no structural order. order in this. It is, it's kind of a disordered uh, system, oxide system. But then it has a high mobility, a high, a high mobility for the lithium. Lithium can easily move around. Um, I think the conductivity, lithium ion conductivity is uh, 10 power minus 2, 10 power minus 3 semen per centimeter, if I remember. Uh, uh, so they use this as an electrolyte. It's not an anode or cathode. But then they use, in the work, the person good enough to work, maybe you can you can look for this particular thing, Bragg, I think Braga is the, uh, B-R-A-G-A. Braga is a person, another researcher who, did, who is the first author in this work. Um, they have used a lithium on either side of this electrolyte. And surprisingly, it shows a very high voltage. There were a lot of criticism on this. Uh, so, of course, uh, uh, there was a news about, you know, uh, at the age of 97 uh, years, you know, Professor Goodenough has again done it, something like that. When he did LICO vote, it was, he was 57, and after 40 years, you know, almost at the age of 97, he again um, uh, made a big change in the battery, the way it worked. Something of that sort, no news came, and but it looks like uh, they are perceiving it to really understand what is happening. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, if if there are no more questions, of course, uh, we can write an email to Sudhakar and uh, get some right input as well whenever uh, afterwards you have some time. Uh, however, uh, Professor Sudhakar, uh, how about our uh, progress, this uh, similar research and the corresponding uh, manufacturing aspects of this in India? Were related to lithium ion battery, etc. Mm -hmm. e by any chance, uh, there are many. Uh, unfortunately, I think we don't have any. Uh, for example, the the components required anode and cathode. You know, you have to produce them in uh, in tons and tons to make large number of batteries. I think we don't have that facility, and there are there are efforts to put such plants. Uh, for material synthesis as well as uh, battery production in a large a large numbers uh, even to produce something uh, of 100 kilowatt hour i think there are no uh, no facilities government based one i i am not sure about the even the uh, private parties as well most of the thing what they do is they buy the small batteries and assemble them together ah uh, yeah yeah which is not <laughs> going to work out on a long time. <laughs> yes, we have yes. to do the batteries here ourselves. 
and that is something challenging and uh, yeah <laughs> okay understood sir so uh, if uh, no more question then uh, let us thank uh, professor sudhakar chandran for this very very thank you so much very you, right uh, very much insight starting with basics introductory and then bringing us to the point where we start thinking about applying right at the same time materials and its progress so nicely thank you so much thank you for very your much. input and uh, uh, so we are extremely sorry for not keeping memento ready today, oh, no, no, no. but it will be it will be delivered to your <laughs> please uh -huh. and uh, yeah thank you so yeah. much thank you so, so much, much. Right. Yeah, so i can your, not record uh, yes yes okay. yeah um, and uh, right with this uh, ratna kumar professor ratna kumar please uh, take over yes 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 so yeah I, i would also like to thank professor sudhakar chandran for accepting our invitation uh, and uh, delivering the talk despite uh, he was busy with the departmental work recently but uh, thank you very much sudhakar thank and you. thank you everyone for joining us today yeah thanks for uh, arranging this uh, talk in fact it was it was good i also learned a lot during this preparation yeah nice <laughs> okay Hi everyone. Uh, so uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you Professor Ratna Kumar, Professor Dilip, everyone, uh, for all right continuous arrangements and everything. So nice of you, sir. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Thank you.